Hello, this is Keela, and today I'm going to read to you a little bit of a story. that I wrote, oh geez, probably in the 80s and never finished, but here we go. It was a beautifully sunny day, the kind that just ordinarily makes one feel that it's good to be alive, but Lila Reed stirred for the first time at quarter past one. Her head throbbed, her stomach felt as if it were on fire, and as she opened her eyes, she gasped with pain at the st sudden stab of light. Damn, she muttered irritably as she weakly rolled out of bed and staggered to pull down a shade on the offending light. For a moment, she considered the consequences of having a drink so early, but her body screamed its protest, so she soon dropped the idea. How had she gotten home, she wondered. It was getting to that point already, she thought dully. Next thing you know, I won't even be able to remember my name, she said to herself and the walls around her. With that thought still in mind, she rushed for the bottle of pain relievers on the dresser, thanking heaven for fast relief. Feeling only slightly better, Lila made her way to the bathroom. Unbidden, the slogan popped into her head, How do you spell relief? She said mock seriously to her haggard reflection with a grin. Instantly, she regretted the peal of laughter that escaped her at the thought as pain again stabbed unmercifully at her temples. Weakly, she sat down to regain some semblance of composure. A bath, she muttered to herself. That always makes me feel much better. I'll have a bath. Lila checked her finished reflection in the mirror before her. She did indeed feel much better. The late nights and heavy drinking were certainly taking their toll on her appearance. She was attractive enough with her glossy dark hair and laughing hazel eyes, but it was taking heavier and heavier applications of makeup to conceal the unnatural pallor of her skin and the purplish shadows in the hollows beneath her eyes. Lila knew the causes of this depreciation in her looks, but as yet a part of her still refused to face the truth. She was destroying herself, and she knew it. For what reason? She wondered cynically. For some damn ghost of the past? Determinedly, she closed her mind to such soul-searching questions. It was now 3.15, and she didn't intend to waste the rest of the day. In the kitchen, she grabbed a quick cup of instant coffee, which would suffice as her missed breakfast, and possibly even lunch. In no more than ten minutes, she had her jacket on and was out the door into the fresh spring air. Quickly, she searched her purse, and finding the object she sought, she finally placed her sunglasses on her nose. She hadn't really given much thought to where she ought to go, but finally she decided on the shopping mall uptown. She would need a taxi for such a trip, so she phoned at the closest payphone, and then she was on her way. The mall was bright with the new spring colors, and Lila found that she was delighted with many of the newest fashions, too. It seemed to her, as she ambled along among the throng, however, that she was the only singular person in the place. Everyone was smiling hand in hand, and none seemed to have a care in the world. She felt a momentary stab of jealousy at not being able to join in this com their camaraderie, but stifled it quickly. It hadn't shown in her face, she was sure, but feelings of that sort only make one more unhappy, and it might show through her so well-constructed facade. Lila was of the opinion that one should at least appear to be content with their lot. Things went along much more smoothly that way. After several hours and nearly a dozen extravagant purchases, her nausea had finally subsided and she was beginning to feel hungry. Briefly, she thought of fixing herself dinner at home, but besides the fact that the cupboards were bare, she knew that she couldn't face the evening so alone. She decided to take a taxi and drop her packages at home first and have him wait while she quickly freshened up and changed her attire. She tossed the packages onto her unmade bed and decided on a green silk affair for dinner wear as she deftly maneuvered her hair into a suitable evening fashion. She transferred the contents of her purse into the matching handbag and hurried back to the, the waiting taxi. Where would she dine, she wondered. 
She was dressed for Ramon's, she thought, and after slight hesitation, her decision was made. After all, she just might run into some old friends, or possibly new ones. Her bank account was starting to ebb anyway, so a little business mixed with pleasure was hardly a distasteful idea. And that's the end of that short story. I have another one, but it's a little bit messy, so I think I will leave that one alone. Here's something that's a little better written and not as painful as it was, written in March of 1984. There was just something about him that drew me, some indefinable magnetism. I could never put my finger on it. I didn't even like him. In fact, with time, I came to almost dislike him, and yet I loved him. I mean, there were qualities in him that I much admired, such as a certain sensitivity and artisticness. But the sensitivity became more and more repressed as time went by. He became hardened and cynical, seemingly indifferent, hateful even. But the magnetism that had first taken hold seemed to grow. Sorry, itchy nose. He was vulnerable in the beginning. He grew strong, and yet he weakened, perhaps even destroyed the true heart of himself in so doing. The gentleness that had drew me in the first, in at first was gone, but something much stronger than ordinary attraction held me in thrall, even when he became cruel. Not physically, but emotionally and mentally cruel. I don't know what caused him to change. I still grieve over the loss, as if a part of him died and a part of me with him. I wanted to reach him before it was too late, to revive that dying beauty. And though I tried so very hard, and for so very long, I failed to reach him. And even though I gave it my all, I still feel as though I did not try hard enough, or long enough, or I would not have failed. There were times when I thought I had reached him, when I thought I had gained his trust, he told me things about himself in bits and pieces that I don't believe he'd ever told anyone else. He even said he loved me. And yet, each time I felt that we were growing closer, he would turn on me almost viciously and try to destroy me as if I were the enemy. Every time. I grew only more and more confused. Why? Who or what had caused him to become this way? Just when I thought I had begun to understand, he would attack again unprovoked. I was not the enemy. At times I was his only ally. I would have done anything to please him. My loyalty went without question. Why did he turn on me so? I still do not know whether he doubted my love and loyalty, and it was some kind of testing or what. Did I know too much? Was he growing to depend on me, and did he hate the thought of such a dependence? Or was it merely some sort of cruel and twisted game? As for the attraction that held me, it only grew stronger. It became an obsession. At what point in time and what stage of our relationship, I'm not sure. I only know that it became an all-consuming and self-destructive sickness to me. It filled nearly every waking second. I could not even sleep for thinking of it. Still, on occasion, I can feel its old familiar pull at my heart. Even though he did his best to make it evident that he wanted no part of me, there were times when he would string me along. He still has not set me completely free, even though it was his intent. What is it that holds me still? Oddly enough, he warned me once about his character. It was very near the final end, right after yet another emotional assault. He told me that he was not and never had been a nice person. He said that he was vulnerable once, but that was a very different thing. Oh, but that was very different than a long time ago. I might think that deep down he was a nice person, but that I should not be deceived. Before that, there was a seemingly simple message. It merely said, love is not a commitment. 
No greeting, no closing, just a simple statement. I did not comprehend its meaning. Why would he even bother to warn me if he was indeed as wicked as he would have the world, including me, to believe? Like all the other pieces of this confusing puzzle, it does not make sense. The questions are endless and haunting. The answers are ever elusive. What was he trying to tell me? Though I now see more objectively, I still do not understand. I still don't have any answers, only unanswered questions and half-formed hypotheses. Why did he mean so much to me when I meant so little to him? Why can't I simply forget him now? Does he ever remember me? And if so, how? As a fool? I'm not even sure how I feel about him anymore. Do I still love him? Do I hate him? I only know that I'm not indifferent. Once I loved him overly much, but it has changed. It is possible that I could justify my feelings now, were they of hatred, and yet I feel no malice towards him. I get angry now, which I did not in the past, but it isn't hatred. He even went so far as to add insult to injury in the end, but how does that make me feel towards him? I'm not sure. I only know I can't forget. He took the gift I offered, the most precious thing one human being could offer to another, and trampled it underfoot as though it were meaningless. How do I feel about that? Hurt? Betrayed? Angry? Is it not my own fault? If not, then whose? I only hope and I pray, but it's not too late for him. I pray that somewhere deep down inside him there is something left of that inner light and that somehow there is still a chance of its being revived. Not for my sake so much as for his. I tried my best. My best just wasn't good enough. Still, I feel it would all be worth it if I helped to illuminate even a single corner of his heart. If I gave him even a single ray of sunshine, then it was worth it. But how can I ever know? when my line of communication has been severed. Perhaps I shall die and the mystery shall remain unsolved. Was the torment and turmoil of loving him so deeply really worth it? Were the tears I shed all worthless and in vain? Was the love I bore him all just meaningless? Was it worth the death of my pride? Was it worth the pain? Has nothing changed from the beginning? Is it really better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Are there any answers? I just don't know. I just don't know. If there are any answers, then I haven't found them. Should I regret? I regret the loss, but not the love. I regret that I was forced to give up the fight. I regret that he never really understood me and that he never really cared. A part of me is glad that it's over now, but another part of me is saddened at the thought that I shall never see him again. Actually, I'm afraid to do so. I'm just not sure how I would react. And I'm just beginning to get over. I'm afraid that all the old feelings would return from their sleep and I would lose my fledgling independence. As it is, that old obsession often reawakens to torment me. There are many songs that state the way I feel, especially those sung by Phil Collins. I should like to sing them to my old flame, especially one entitled, I Don't Care Anymore. Never mind if that's not true. It fits the situation to perfection. I was 19 when I wrote that. Let's see here. Maybe I can end with a one or two. I know I've shared these before, but here we go. And this one was written about the same fellow that I wrote that about. What would be the difference? If you could see things through my eyes, then you might call me fool or wise. You might see through my clown's disguise, but what would be the difference? And if I could see things through your eyes, could we then find a compromise and do away with alibis? I doubt it. And could I change your point of view to let you see things as I do? Would I not also be changing you? I can't do it. 
For if I changed you, and you changed me, and we could see as the other sees, it'd still be you and I, not we, though we might understand. We'd still be opposite extremes, with our treasure troves of broken dreams, still pulling ourselves apart at the seams, just pulling in different directions. And later, I can cope. One day I'm lost, next day I'm found. One hour up, the next I'm down. Once I believed and once I hoped. Once I despaired and then I groped. One hour laughed, next hour cried. One hour given, the next denied. Once I despaired and then I groped. Then I stood up, and yes, I coped. For I have loved and laughed and dreamed, back and forth in two extremes. And in love I've won and lost, and I've learned at quite a cost, that where once I despaired, and then I groped, I've taken hold, and I can cope. Okay, that's it to end out my four-day weekend on, uh, I believe it's President's Day or Washington's birthday. Anyway, um, be kind to one another, and uh, remember, love is never wasted. Love yourselves and love each other. Peace. Talk to you later.